Again, we gather for worship, we invoke the presence of God. We acknowledge this is the God that we worship. We speak his name and say where God's name is, he is. We remember people gathered together to worship and they called upon the name of the Lord. Do that again this morning with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace throughout all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit and when I stand up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. And lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. These words of 1 John call us then to a time of confession. 
This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship him, with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. I invite you to take a moment to think about those words and then reflect upon your life this past week. Reflection of the thoughts today. Who's been the hero of your story this week? Have you been the center of your life, or has God been the center? Has the focus been on your concerns and worries and fears and doubts and sort of ends up being all about me? Or have there been times in this past week when really it was about, God, how do I love and serve you with all that I am? Our prayer today is we have a time to confess and say, God, you know my heart. You know where I've wrestled and struggled. We take this moment to stand with each other and sort of say, God, we're fellow sinners together in need of your love and forgiveness. Hear my confession. We take a moment of silence to confess our sin. We pray. Merciful Father, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, he forgives us all our sins. As the called ordained servant of the word of God and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before you sit down, I want to just invite you again to acknowledge this moment when we've just said, God, please forgive me. You may think we do that together just as individuals, just me and God say, forgive me, he forgives you. But part of being the church and the people of God on earth is to acknowledge that we're brothers and sisters in this faith together. And we accept this forgiveness and grace of God, but then we live it out and we share it in the world. So as you greet one another, you can't shake hands or hug each other, but please turn and say, peace the Lord be with you. And we take this forgiveness of God and we have this holy moment on earth when we not only receive the forgiveness of God, but we let that overflow from our lives to each other and we forgive one another. Please share the peace of Christ with each other and then you may be seated. Peace be with you, Once again, I want to thank you on behalf of, of everybody in our congregation for your ongoing generosity and support. As we say to God, I will give to you the first and the best of my life and set aside that first as a, a tithe to you. And with some of you, there are extra offerings along the way, those tithes and offerings. We appreciate what they're able enable us to do as the life of a church. If you're at home or online, you have an opportunity to support what we're doing. Uh, we're looking for opportunities and ways that we can inspire one another to be on this movement of reaching a lost world with the gospel. Part of that is just to acknowledge if you've not picked up your offering envelopes yet as you leave today, they're by the door on the right-hand side, so please grab those on your way out the door today so we don't have to mail them to you and get them to you, so uh, envelopes are available there. Uh, school enrollment is available for all new students, and they can apply uh, online. There's a slide that has that about that on there. Uh, you know, hclcindy.org forward slash school. Uh, that allows you to go and register. If your current family is a part of the school, you can literally go into your parent portal and Red Web, Red Web and, and register at this time. It's kind of fun. We're already thinking about school for next year. Uh, so part of that's uh, part of the life of our church. And next there's a slide that, uh, there's a slide that has some slides on it. No, there's no slides. Okay, well. 
well, I will be your slide today. Da, 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 da. Uh, there's opportunity also to be a part of this uh, Faith at Home initiative. And the idea is that there's an opportunity to go and text uh, messages that will come to your home. Uh, check the weekly update. It has the links to that on there. And you select that then twice a day on, on Monday and on Thursday. You get a text that allows you to have a conversation. If you have preschool kids or elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids, or as adults, kind of a little video clip to take to Sunday thoughts and keep them connected throughout your week, keep you thinking about that. Our, our idea is to try and bring the thoughts of Sunday worship and make that a part of our ongoing life. As we say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, and he wants to be the hero of my story. How do we continue to keep that thought throughout the week? So there's an opportunity to do that. Please sign up for those, and I'll text you to your phone a couple times a week, uh, beginning on, on Monday and then again on Thursday. I invite you to speak the Apostles' Creed together with me as we confess our faith in our God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The New Testament reading is from Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, become, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand out of reverence for the words of Jesus in the Gospel. Today's Gospel is in John chapter 1. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, whom is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This time we have our children to sort of pay attention to the screen. Ms. Hannah's going to share with you our children's message for the day. Jesus can do that you and I cannot do 
and even Superman cannot do. <clears throat> Take a minute with the person next to you. See if you can make a list of some of the amazing powers that Jesus has. That's right. The Bible tells us that Jesus has the power to heal. He healed people. People that were blind were given their sight. People that couldn't walk were suddenly leaping and dancing and praising God. Jesus had the power to multiply loaves of bread and fish to feed thousands of people. Jesus had the power to turn water into wine, and he even raised people from the dead. Talk about superpower. But the most important thing that Jesus did that you and I could not do was that he lived a perfect life. Jesus didn't sin, not even once. And because he lived a perfect life for us, and because of his great love for us, he even took our place on the cross. Jesus died for us, but he did not stay dead. We read in the Bible that Jesus rose from the dead. Talk about a superpower. He's the only one that could have done that for us. Jesus is our hero. I want you to talk today and this whole week with your family and with your friends about the amazing things Jesus does. He always saves the day with his power because he is full of love for you. Let's thank God for the amazing superhero that Jesus is. Will you please fold your hands and pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Jesus. He is amazing and powerful and full of love. Help me to remember that he died for me, rose for me, and loves me no matter what. Jesus is my hero. Amen.
first of all, thank you so much, Parker and Ellen and John McDonald and Brad Walsh. Um, they changed out a soundboard this weekend so that we won't in the future have as many technical difficulties. And so thanks for your patience as we work through all those bugs and all. Let's begin with prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you for being our God and being in this place. Uh, for the words that you give us and the promises that you declare upon us. Lord, we pray your spirit will be here, um, that we would hear of your promises and we would hear of how your spirit works in our life and how you have come to be our hero. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last week we began this new series called Don't Waste Your Life, and it's a series where we ask a, a series of pretty serious questions like, are you who you want to be? <laughs> when you look at your life, is it how you wanted it to be or do you, how you dreamt it would be? Or is it less than what you thought? And do you question whether, you know, you've wasted parts or wasted opportunities or if you've wasted your story? The Bible's crystal clear and that no matter who you are, there is but one one ultimate reason, one ultimate purpose for existing in this life. And either you pursue it or you don't. And so the series is about aligning our, our lives as individuals and as a family of faith under that one crystal clear purpose. Why? So that together, together we can understand what it means to make the most of this one life that we are given. To be able to honor God with this life rather than risk losing or wasting this life. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to begin in Galatians 6, and so you can pull it out and turn there with me. We'll get there in just a moment. So last week we talked about how the best way to look at this life that we're given is to look at it as a story. And that's not only biblical, but it also is really important because it helps us to ask some important questions like, where am I in my story? I mean, am I at the beginning of that story or at a, a crucial turning point in the middle or, or towards the end or when my last page is turned and my credits are rolling, the world around me that has been watching or reading my story, are they going to see some significant influence from that or are they going to just kind of throw their hands up and go, eh? And so the first question that we asked ourselves last week the main question we'd ask is, what is our story about? Because every life, every story is ultimately about something. And we learned how Jesus draws this line in the sand. And he says, either your life is going to be all about making much of you, or it's about being, making much of him. And if it's all about making much of you, if that's the whole purpose of your life, well, it's going to be a waste of story. But if it's all about making much of him, of, of God through Jesus then it's going to be a life well lived with great purpose. And so after we learn what our story is to be about, that as followers of Jesus, it's to be about him, well, then we get to go to, go to some of the other questions that we might have and look at some of the other things, like who are some of the essential characters that should be in our story. And, and we start with the one character that every story must have, right? Who's our hero? Because every story has a hero. I mean, think about it. Little, Little Mermaid, it was Prince Eric. Monsters, Inc., it was Sully. Snow White, it was Prince Philip. Yes, I had to look up a couple of these. <laughs> you got Batman, Superman, we just learned about just a moment ago. I saw that there's a new Wonder Woman movie that's out. And you got John McClane from Die Hard and Die Harder and Die Hardest and Die, you know, all kinds of different ones. You've got heroes like William Wallace from Braveheart. Anybody like that one? Okay, none of you say, okay, one. All right, thank you. You know, we have all these different kinds of heroes that are out here. You've got the hero that gets the girl and the girl that gets the guy. And you've got the, the hero, who over, the underdog who overcomes. And yet, no matter what kind of hero you're talking about, in every story, in every life, they serve the same purpose. Because the hero is the one, the character in the story upon whom all the other hopes the hang upon, the one where the story depends upon to bring about the ideal ending and how the hero fares is how, what kind of story it is. And if they overcome, it, it's got a, a 
a fairy tale ending, right? And if they, if they die, it's a tragedy. If they fall in love, well, then it's a romantic comedy, and uh, my wife will probably try to talk me into watching at some point. And yet, if every life and every story has a hero, then we have to ask the question, who's mine? Mm-hmm. Who's my hero? If every story hinges on someone to save the day, to seal the deal, to to show their power in order to bring about some kind of ideal ending to my story and my life's a story, then I've got to be able to answer a couple of really key questions like, what is the ideal ending that I am seeking in my story and who am I looking to to help bring it? Who is my hero? That question can seem kind of deep, right? And yet... (laughs) I don't know, as we look at our culture, as we look at 2021 and the United States of America, really for most people, it's not very hard. It's not very hard to figure out. Because really, most people today, the hero of their story is themselves. The ideal ending is kind of this, 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 well, this ending that we've been told in our culture that it's all to be about, you know, to have the great family, to have the fat retirement, to to be successful in work and get some rewards in life, to be known as a great mom, a good guy, the, the person with good looks, whatever. And so we resign to that mentality of be all that you can be, just do it, it's all about you. Only you can make a change. You can make your best life now. You know, it's kind of that American dream that we can go from rags to riches by the sweat of our brow. And, and where does that lead us? Well, it leads us then to, like, I don't know, brag about our accomplishments and our, our stuff and our skills and our kids and our grandkids and our past. Which, if you think about it, just draws a line straight back to me. Because oftentimes we live as if we are our own hero. Look what I did. Even most religions, even a lot of so-called Christian denominations, we fall into that trap. Even though we may claim to have some other hero at the heart of it all, it really ends up boiling down to me because... I've got to be spiritual enough, or I've got to be devoted enough, or I've got to be holy enough to earn this ideal uh, ending that I'm seeking, which is called the afterlife. It's all on me. The problem, though, with me being the hero is that I'm not all that superhuman. I fail. I do stupid things. I have days when, you know what, work stresses me out, and I take it out on my kids or my family at home, or when when things are crazy at home, and I I, I bring it with me at work, right? I I have moments where I get overwhelmed and helpless, and there are moments when super mom or uh, amazing dad or incredible grandma, they just can't magically fix that which is broken. Don't have an answer for when all of a sudden you get laid off. Or you catch COVID. Or you realize you live in a world that's deeply divided and there's no real quick fix or answer. Or you get diagnosed with cancer. Or you realize that the relationship, your marriage is struggling. And there's no easy answer. And all of a sudden, you have nowhere to turn. Life seems so unfair. You wonder if it's all getting wasted. Or maybe, (laughs) or maybe we're pursuing the wrong ending. Maybe we're looking to the wrong hero. See, the problem, the real problem in the story, this life that we're living is, (laughs) is you. It really is. See, what we believe, what the Bible teaches, is that no matter who you are, all of our stories have the same problem. And it's, it's that we're corrupted by our sin. We're born broke and from day one. We're, we're born sinful. And, and all of a sudden, we, we realize that we always just, 
We assume the worst in other people. We, we just naturally uh, look out for ourselves. We naturally come back with those witty little painful comebacks to other people. We naturally do things that sabotage relationships and hurt other people. We naturally do the things that lead to a wasted life. So the problem is, is that we're be broken beyond what we can repair or what any other created thing can help us fix. Because the Bible says that there is no one righteous, not even one. In, in every possible way, we fall short uh, of God's standards. And so not only do we not know him and love him, we can't possibly make ourselves right with him. We can't. And if we're honest with ourselves, we, if we take a close enough look, we have to confess that, that we fall short. We fall short as husbands. We fall short as employees, as parents, as children, as citizens, as friends. We fall short in every aspect of our life. And then we're ungrateful about all the things that we have, right? We, all the things that have been given to us, all the things that God has blessed us with, with our, even our breath and our life and our talents and, and, and the stuff that surrounds us. And, and, and we look at anything that we have and we give ourselves the credit for it. We think we're the one that have accomplished it. And so like some ungrateful, irresponsible kids, we deserve punishment. See... <laughs> Apart from some grace from God, some intervention from God, on my final day, I, I will be judged by God based simply on my broken abilities to be able to do this, to be my own hero, to make myself right in the eyes of God based upon how I love my kids and do my job and pay my bills and love my neighbor. And quickly what I discover is that those things... Um, Apart from any kind of intervention from the grace of God, those things that I even brag about, the things that I'm proud about, the things that I enjoy actually serve to convict me before God. Things I love and want to boast about will not only be taken from me, at the end, but those things like my job and my relationship with my wife and, and my parenting, also, there's overwhelming evidence of how broken I am, how rebellious I've become, how much evil is inside of me. And when I try to stand before a holy God based on my own abilities and my own heroism, I fail. And so I desperately need something more. I, I need a hero, a hero that delivers me from my sin. So now Galatians 6, starting at verse 14, Paul says this, he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So about Paul, he, he's a guy who, I, I don't know if you've heard this before, but he's claimed that he is the chief of sinners. He's the worst of sinners. And yet now what he's saying is I'm not only the worst of sinners, but I also have a hero I have someone to rescue me from all of that. And I'd be ridiculous to boast, to brag, to put my hope in anything but that hero. Anything but Jesus. See, Jesus is that hero, the, the one who's true God, but also who came as a living, breathing, blood in his vein man, who entered this world to live perfectly, to replace our imperfect world that, that was unjustly murdered in our place and upon a cross, where God took all the, the, the things that we've done, all the garbage and all the mistakes, and he's placed it on, of, on him and, and took out his anger and his wrath upon him. He could have taken it out on us, but it would have annihilated us, but instead he placed it on him who was perfect who made the ultimate sacrifice. And that sacrifice was acceptable and pleasing and, and powerful as he then rose again from the dead. You know, in our service, in our liturgy, when we get to the confession absolution, especially in the absolution time, we, 
we oftentimes reference 1 John chapter 1. We just heard it a little bit ago as far as our confession. Um, and here's how it goes. It says, if we confess our sins, God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It, if we're honest with ourselves that we are not the hero of this life, that we need a hero, he will become that ultimate hero in our lives. All we have to do is trust that, have faith in him that he is that hero. Right before it, he says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Christ's blood shed, his life given on a cross, gives you forgiveness for the sin that convicts you and, and frees you from the guilt that, that pursues you and, and, and the things that you want to cover up and make sure nobody else knows about. And that's why Paul says, I can't boast in anything other than Jesus. Because he's a hero and he's come and he's changed my story. He's, he's come and he's changed the verdict. He's come and he's changed the ending. He's changed where, where I find meaning and where I find purpose and hope and joy. He's come to change everything. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. This is Paul. He says this. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So here's, here's what Paul is trying to say here. He's saying, Jesus is the hero of our lives, and knowing, knowing him and, and holding on to him we realize that nothing can hold a candle next to him. And not our, not our kids, not our, our jobs, not our success, not our massive money. Nothing can stand up to him. I mean, we have a lot of blessings in this life, right? And a good family and, I don't know, a good career, Wonderful houses, those are wonderful things, but they're not the goal and they're not the God. In fact, Paul would go on to say, if you force me to choose, I'd tell you that all the other stuff is garbage. Well, that's the translation here in the NIV, but do you know that other translations call it rubbish? I kind of like that word, doesn't it? It's all rubbish, right? And yet if you go into the Greek and you look at it, it you can come up with other, other words like Dung, dare I say crap? That's what he's saying. All the other stuff is garbage compared to Jesus. And that's why I hold on to Jesus. My story has one hero and one hope, which is Jesus. And friends, it's a hard thing to wrap our minds around, isn't it? I mean, because the Bible's clear. Not only should, should Paul have this attitude towards Christ, but we should have it also. And so if we were forced to say, to say that, you know, that everything else is trash and Jesus is treasure, could you actually say that? Could you honestly, truthfully say that? Now, please understand that God's not oh, wanting us to go around the rest of the world and thinking of it in such negative terms like, you know, dear, how was dinner? Well, you know, from a biblical perspective, honey, it was rubbish. No, I got a verse. I really do. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, he doesn't want us to go around with a negative view of everything in life. He just wants us to realize that the only thing that is priceless in this world is the cross of Christ. And the only way we get there is through a lifelong journey of, 
of realizing, of getting how, you know what, our sin has come in and it's totally ruined our story. It's totally ruined our life. And yet an unlikely hero who came in an unlikely way, who didn't come to be served, but actually to sacrifice, to give up his life for me, has come to win back and redeem my story and yours. You know, it's MLK weekend. And it's during times like this that we think of the real life stories in, in our life and in our culture, right? My family, we had the opportunity to visit the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis a couple of times. And an amazing museum that, that celebrates some of those heroes that have been in our culture and in our life, in our country. Um, it's built right where Martin Luther King Jr. was, was shot and killed. And so we celebrate some of those, those heroes like Martin Luther King Jr., a guy who, who spoke of faith and of love and of, of hope even in the midst of hate and injustice, a guy who had, had a dream uh, of where things could be, and yeah, we're, 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 not, we're not where he dreamed we would be, but it's through people like him that the needle has changed, it's moved, because heroes... <laughs> They can change things, can't they? You know, this past year, it's been kind of interesting that all of a sudden, uh, we have started to wake up and see some of those real-life heroes right in our midst, right? Uh, I don't know if it's because we've had less movies that we've that's come out or if we've had more time to think in the midst of uh, quarantine or if it's because uh, we really need them. But also, uh, I remember back in April, we were talking about the delivery guy, the mailman, as being a hero, didn't we? Anybody who has ever had to do remote learning knows that their teachers are heroes, right? Thank you for investing in our kids. And then the healthcare workers, oh my goodness. I can only imagine for some of those people over the last nine months who spent some significant time maybe fighting COVID in the hospital, how if they were home for the holidays, they, they had a toast <laughs> for the doctors and the nurses who, who were there for them and nursed them back to help health who took care of them and loved them because heroes can change things, right? They can change everything. And once a hero has really impacted you, everything in life then becomes a chance to boast about them, to, to brag on them, to thank them, to be re reminded of them. And that's what Paul is trying to say here when he says uh, boasting in Christ. We should boast in Jesus because he's made the eternity difference for us as he gave up his life for yours. So, just thinking about how, how that gets lived out, right? As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, how, who, how do I make sure that it doesn't always keep pointing back to me, but it gets pointing back to the cross and back to Christ? You know, I... I think I have the best job in the world. I really do. And it's even more exciting because my, I have a bunch of kids who go to school here. And so I get to see them on a regular basis, even in the midst of COVID. And, and when I see them in the hall, yeah, you know, I got two that are teenagers that, well, two that come here that are teenagers that kind of lost their mind a little bit. But, you know, most of my kids, okay, all of my kids, they'll still recognize me and acknowledge me, right? They'll, they'll wave. Some of them will come give me a hug or give me a high five. And I love that. And my best Part of my life, my day, is when I come home after work. And if I've been gone for a while and, and my two-year-old is still there and is around, she comes, you get, if you had kids, you remember that? Where you come, daddy, 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 and you get the big, like, one on the leg that you got to drag along with you. I love that. I love that. I love sitting down with my kids and, and talking to them about their day. I love going on walks with them or playing catch or shooting baskets. I love it because, you know what? Jesus allows me to get past the, the times that I, I mess up and be able to say I'm sorry to, to him and to my kids so that I can be the best that I can be. It all points back to the cross. 
we always draw a line back to the cross. So thank you. If you enjoy your work and what you do, you're fulfilled by it. It's because of the cross. If you find peace and comfort, even as you go through a struggle, whether it's relational or sickness or whatever, it's because of the cross. If you can go to a funeral and still sing praises to God, I got to do that this past week. It's because of the cross. It's always because of the cross. Having faith in Jesus allows us to draw a line back to him in all things. Because he is our, the hero of our story. The hero of our lives. I want to leave you with three concrete ways that as followers of Jesus, we can live each day with him as our hero in our life. First, if Jesus is really your hero, then all the other ones have to go away. And so it starts by idolizing him, worshiping him. If someone else in your life holds the key to the hope that you have in your life, you've got to demote them. Because honestly, a lot of us, we, we struggle with doing a lot of idolatry of a lot of other people in our life. And so he needs to have that number one spot. Number one, idolize him. Number two, talk about him. I mean, think about it. If your life was saved, if you were pulled from a fire by some guy, you'd be, you'd be telling everybody about that experience, wouldn't you? You'd be telling everybody about that guy. Or if you spent a week in the hospital, on ICU, with, on a ventilator, and, and the doctors and the nurses, they, they, they walked you through that, and now you're back on your feet, you would be seen in their praises, wouldn't you? How much more should we be doing the same thing about the one who has saved us eternally? Who's fixed this relationship between us and God and given us the promise of life everlasting? Talk about it. And you know, the number one place that happens is, is at home, you know, with our kids and with our, our spouse and with the other people we live with. And then it, it kind of, the sphere of influence around us, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. Who do you brag about? Who do you talk about? Who do you point to in those relationships? So idolize him, talk about him. Then heroes, they become models and icons, don't they, in our life? I remember growing up, um, I just want to be like Mike, and so Michael Jordan was on the wall, right? I had a big old poster like that. I, I don't know if they do that anymore today, do they? I think instead they want to be like somebody, and they do TikTok and things about them. Or something. But you, we, we want to idolize, we want to be like the heroes in our life. If Jesus is our hero, at some point we have to stop copying others, we need to imitate him. If he's our hero, then the question is, how do we copy him? How do we, are we more and more like him? Uh, as, as biblical scholars, we use this big word called sanctification as we talk about it. And it's this idea of becoming a new creation more like God. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Who are you trying to live like? Be like? So idolize him, talk about him, imitate him. You know, I once did a funeral where out of the blue, someone just stepped up and read a love poem. It's the weirdest thing ever, let me tell you. But it was also the saddest thing ever. Because here's the words. She was my north, my south, my east, and west. My working week and my Sunday, Sunday rest. My noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. <sighs> so sad, isn't it? You know, if you put your hope 
in anyone or anything other than Jesus, it's going to disappoint. It's going to fail. Jesus is the only one that will, will come through. He's the only one that will never disappoint. He is the only one that can change everything, really change everything, and free us to enjoy all things. My prayer is that you would make Jesus your hero. You would hold on to Jesus as the one that brings you hope. Will you stand with me as we go and close in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son into this world to do the unthinkable. The only thing that could save me and redeem my story is, is you, Jesus. By you being my ultimate hero, for, by dying for me in my place, and yet showing your power by rising again so that I might know what life is and be overwhelmed by grace and experience purpose and peace. Lord, help me. Help me to put my trust in you and have hope in you and worship only you. Help keep me from idolizing others. And by the power of your spirit, give us, give us opportunity to share our story, to bring witness to what we've experienced, to talk about you. And change us, Lord. Change us to be more like you. Make us a new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, we thank you. We thank you for those that have gone before us that have brought light to the inequalities in this world. Thank you for the dream that Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of and how he spoke of love and of hope. Thank you for how far we've come as a country, and yet we still have so much more to go. Help us as individuals, as a church, as a people, as a country, to see where, where we come up short and strive for for love and for equality. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our country that is going through a, a season of division. Tensions are high, emotions are thick. We pray, Lord, for, for you to bring healing to our land and to our country. Help us to listen, to strive for compromise and unity. Help us to look for love and for peace. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, for all those who are sick and struggling with health, need, health needs, you are the great healer. We place them in your hands. Be with the doctors and medical staff and give them wisdom. But it, if it is to your will, Lord, bring healing. For those dealing with depression or relational issues, Lord, you, you, we are, you are the one that we look to. Bring hope and peace uh, and people to come around them and to support them. For those that are dealing with financial struggles, we pray for answers and hope. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, Lord, we bring to you, trusting that you have heard us. And now, as a family of faith, we say those words that you, your son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing verses. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. For that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, indivisible, the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction as it gets poured out into our life. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his unending peace. You've been blessed to be a blessing. Go in that peace. Amen. Jesus Christ, the treasure, out of purest pleasure, true his friend to me. Storms now.